Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. Previously we have examined the ecology of the fierce and difficult to domesticate Griffin, but today we shall discover why the fabulous Hippogriff is a much better choice for a flying mount for your D&D characters. It was Roger E. Moore, uh, detailed in an article called The Ups and Downs of Flying High in Dragon Magazine number 50, that we discovered there were lots of flying creatures in D&D that not uh, not that many of them which should actually serve as mounts. He included hippogriffs, pegasi and griffins on the list along with chimera if they have wings, dragons, manticores, nightmares, wyverns, rocks, pterodons and the different varieties of flying sphinx. Most of these creatures are quite capable of murdering and eating any humanoid who tries to use them as flying mounts however. Most require a lot of work and even so are pretty damn dangerous anyway. Hippogriffs are my pick for the best flying mount out of all of those listed and the Pegasus looks like the best option but there is one very good reason why they are also a bit of a problem. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Historically, from myth and legend, first mentioned in poems by the ancient Greek Virgil, they are, Virgil, they are described as the offspring of a griffin and a horse. Well, that's interesting as griffins are well known for eating horses, but the ancient Greeks attributed all sorts of legendary powers to these fabulous beasts such as being able to fly around the world and to the moon. They are many tales of powerful magicians and knights throughout the ages riding the hippogriff into battle against terrible foes, and the hippogriff is one of the symbols of the Greek god Apollo. In the age-old war between religion and science, various secular scholars picked the hippogriff as a perfect example of how such hybrid creatures are completely ludicrous, as the wings of such beasts would be have to be so large to support its weight that it would not, never actually get off the ground, let alone carry a rider. In ancient France, the popular folklore was supported by reports of telltale claw marks on stones in the places where the tales told that these creatures roosted. But this has all been, of course, completely disproven. In the fantasy worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, however, the griffins, the pegasi, and the hippogriffs form a closely related trio of monstrous species. The griffin is by far the most aggressive and dangerous of the three. The pegasus is the most intelligent and has a celestial origin in 5th edition D&D. The hippogriff is the least dangerous as they are not actually predators most of the time. Despite that predatory appearance to their eagle head and front claws, they are relative, relatively passive animals that, not, um, that rarely attack humanoids or large animals like horses. I mentioned that pegasi are less suitable as a flying mount and this is not because they're any less capable of doing the job, it's simply because the pegasi is an intelligent creature, a celestial being with a very noble and lawful sense of justice plus an abiding love of freedom. The only way you're going to get to ride from a, a pegasus is if they invite you. Otherwise, they will resist any and all attempts to force them to serve any master, even one with the best of intentions. Hippogriffs have a much, much more pleasant disposition. They're quite easy to care for and are even better than horses when it comes to serving as mounts, though not in regard to pulling carts and wagons, which they're not well suited for. You, uh, you might think that a breeder of flying mounts would keep griffins, pegasi and hippogriffs and sell them to different buyers. Well, no, that would be an absolute disaster. Griffins will eat hippogriffs and pegasi. Hippogriffs tend to become very aggressive towards pegasi for some reason and when left alone with them they will bully them relentlessly. All of them require one-on-one -on -one training for many months from birth. The griffin will only bond with one master. That rider has to be the one who raised it or um, will be present at the training sessions with the the uh, tamer of exotic animals so that the griffin is raised along with that rider. Hippogriffs will accept any um, another rider, but will still, still need constant attention, taking them on flights, providing them with suitable room. They're a lot easier to feed and care for than griffins, but they need a lot, much more room than any horse to keep in any sort of health and condition. Pegasi are not only very difficult to train, but damn near impossible to break in. They only accept the company of other good beings. They will simply attack and seek to flee from all beings of ill intent. They can smell that evil stink on your murder hobo character a mile off. Save your protestations for the dungeon master. I know what you did to those poor little kobolds. So, hippogriffs have the body of a horse with the wings and head of a hawk or eagle. I'm perfectly fine with having a tropical version with the head and plumage of a parrot though, or an, Ar um, an arctic penguin version, also an alpine raven or a desert vulture. Their forelegs end in very strong sharp talons similar to, similar to those found in birds of prey, while their hind legs have hooves, and the hooves are a defining trait 
as is the uh, the horse-style digitigrade or backward knee-type rear legs. The average hippogriff is 9 feet or 2.74 meters long with a wingspan of 20 feet or 6 meters and weigh about 1,000 pounds or 453 kilograms. So they are in the range of what a young horse can weigh, but an adult horse is between 380 to 550 kilograms or 840 to 1,210 pounds. Clearly, the lifting capacity of the hippogriff's wings is absolutely incredible, as is their general flight agility. They are equipped with broad, long wings with somewhat finger-like indentations on the tips of the wing. The hippogriffs do a lot of gliding flight, preferring to circle around an updrafting thermal to gain attitude, um, altitude. Their flapping flight usually consists of 6-8 to eight deep wing beats interspersed with 2-3 to three second glides. While soaring, the wings are spread out with a fanning of the wingtips, and their rear legs are usually tucked into the body, and at their usual speed, unencumbered in the wild without a rider, is around 45-52 to 52 km per hour, or 28-32 to 32 miles per hour. In ideal conditions, riding gusting winds along ravines and cliffsides, uh, a hippogriff can reach as fast as 190 km per hour, or 120 miles per hour. A power dive, which they almost never do once they reach adult size, is when they hold their legs up and uh, fold their wings tight and partially closed against their body. When diving like this, they can reach an amazing 240 to 320 kilometers per hour, or up to 150 to 200 miles per hour. Of course, they never impact any object going that sort of speed because it would prove instantly fatal. They also never reach that sort of speed with any cargo and no rider could compel them to do that because the hippogriff has no desire to kill itself. About the only time a young hippogriff performs that sort of manoeuvre is in the air uh, when they are displaying flight prowess during courtship of a mate or they are trying to get away from a griffin, a dragon or a wyvern. They inhabit ravines and cliffs across a huge array of different environments from high alpine zones to dense tropical rainforest. Places like the Grand Canyon would be prime hippogriff country, as would the mazes of Arizona or any of the steep inaccessible seaside cliffs around the planet. Hippogriffs are reclusive by nature, rarely moving very far from their nesting sites, though their range is quite large by comparison to something like a mountain goat, obviously, because they can fly. They have a diverse, omnivorous diet and can actually hunt humanoids as often as other meals if they have to. However, they're far more likely to subsist on goats, monkeys, birds, fruits, berries, leafy greens, and any carrion they can find. In fact, you're more than likely to find them pecking over some long dead animal. They nest in areas that are suitable to their needs. Often a nest site will be close to a source of fresh water as they can get. So if you're along a cliffside and there's a freshwater waterfall, uh, look for griffin nests in the most inaccess- inaccessible places. But the, very, uh, the nest is very difficult for non-flying creatures to get to. As mentioned in the 5th edition, monster manual ending the deeply nerdy debate on the subject female hippogriffs give birth to live young they do not lay eggs though in previous edition and out of the articles it certainly claimed that they did so i guess i'll leave it up to you around the nesting site the hippogriffs are extremely territorial and will attack any intruders defending their mate or young to death They attack by diving and attacking with their claws and beak. They are not uh, really as used to this sort of behavior as um, as other creatures. They're much more clumsy and kind of feeble compared to the fearsome griffin. What they do uh, to compensate is they attack together in a large group, which makes them much more formidable. So they're much more of a herd animal than the griffins are. It has been observed that groups of hunting hippogriffs in times of scarce food will act together to bring down larger prey, such as bison, and are even capable of carrying it away in their talons if they work together. Being omnivorous, they really don't need to do this unless times are truly desperate though, as they are much more likely to be badly injured in that sort of hunting style. They exist all across of Torrell and the continent of Faerun, most notably in the Star Spire Mountains in County Starspur and Tethir. They are also uh, along the cliff regions of the Sword Coast and around the Great Collapse Rift far to the east. In suitable nesting areas you can find herds that include one to three males, with one of them having maximum hit points plus an equal number of mares 
Rise and Falls. For the latest edition of the game, they have an armor class of 11 and only 3d10 plus 3 or between 6 and 33 hit points, so far less robust than any griffin or pegasus. They have extremely sharp eyesight with an advantage on all checks involving their vision. They're quite fast with a ground speed of 40 feet per round, a flight speed in combat of around 60 feet per round. If they are not making any uh, high speed dashing maneuvers, I think it's fair to say that these creatures would put a mountain goat to shame when it comes to their ability to get around on some of the most gnarly cliff faces and rocky difficult terrain you can imagine. Those powerful talons on their front legs would help uh, be a great help in clinging to any little crack in an otherwise quite sheer natural rock. When they do attack, they their beak is their primary weapon. They make two piercing attacks with it per round, plus five to hit and doing 1d10 plus three damage, which is actually more than a griffin's beak does. Their claws, also plus five to hit, do 2d6 plus three damage with slashing rakes across their target, and they can make those attacks as they fly over an enemy, avoiding any counter opportunity attack by spending their beak attack actions on disengage with the target as they fly past. So the victim can't spend their reaction in combat to hit the hippogriff every time it sweeps past, slashing with its front talons. With the relatively low hit points of the hippogriff, they would be taken out very quickly otherwise. A typical mainland temperate climate hillside dwelling hippogriff has a russet, golden tan or cream and brown coloured hide with a contrasting shade to its feathers. It's rare to find them with any uniform colour to their entire body, such as all white or black hide and plumage, though they may be bred specifically for such an appearance. Their beaks are almost always either an ivory or a golden yellow colour. Hippogriffs are highly prized as aerial steeds because they're not as intelligent as pegasi or as violent as griffins. A friendly attitude from a hippogriff to the rider or tamer is less vital to their training and use, but they still require a specialised saddle and appropriate training both in how to fly with a rider and for the rider how to fly a flying animal. If you look at the rules for riding in mounted combat, the rules for getting dismounted are quite frequent, so I would say that the specialised saddle for any sort of flying mount basically straps you to the animal so that you can't fall out of the saddle. Uh, particularly if the, hippo the hippogriff is moved against its will during combat, it will cause the rider to be dismounted quite often unless they're strapped in with a specialised saddle. So you can ride them without a specialised saddle, but you're probably going to plummet to your death. If an adventurer happens to have stumbled across a hippo hippogriff nest and survived the fierce battle with the adults, and they may have obtained a hippogriff foal, and if they seek to sell it to an exotic animal merchant or trainer, they're looking at between one or two thousand gold for it. And a trained hippogriff in good condition can be purchased for between three and eight thousand gold in best conditions, depending on how rare they are or how rare trainers of exotic mounts are in that area. And yes, you most certainly can eat a hippogriff. <laughs> I know somebody's going to ask. They are very lean, rich meat, a bit like kangaroo, and a lot tougher than cow, deer, or horse meat, requiring soaking in salting, uh, salted water for about three hours, uh, just a brine solution for about three hours to make it a, a lot nicer as steaks. Otherwise, it's best diced and added to a cook pot along with some barley and beans. There is a particular orc recipe where they make a stew of hippogriff and mountain goat, though you need teeth like a wag to chew it properly and it's just as gamey as it sounds, but undoubtedly nourishing in the cold mountains the orcs call their homeland, far to the north of the spine of the world mountains. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and for their full scripts for these video. Uh, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave and as always, Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you soon.